Okay, good afternoon everybody. Okay, uh, it's the, today is the last lecture in this series of Ring 4 Lasering, and I hope you have enjoyed. And um, I also hope that we will be able to repeat this, maybe not the next semester, but in the next sem summer semester, if you like it. Uh, today, our speaker is Dr. Ruth Kastner. She's a research associate from the University of Maryland uh, at the uh, Department of Philosophy. Um, she actually received uh, her master degree in physics from the same university, and then she moved uh, afterwards to philosophy and received her PhD degree from the University of uh, Maryland, where she works uh, today. She is known for her work in, in transactional interpretation of quantum uh, mechanics, and um, this is an uh, interpretation due to uh, Kramer. But as I learned just right now, not in, not in all aspects she agree, they both agree. In this interpretation, she, uh, her work is uh, in extension of this uh, interpretation to the relativistic domain, and she actually wrote a book about that. It's called The Transactional Interpretation of Quantum Mechanics, The Reality of Possibility, and was published by Cambridge University Press in 2012. Afterwards, she also wrote another book, which is Understanding Our Unseen Reality, Solving Quantum Riddles by Imperial College Press in 2015. And also, uh, another thing that I uh, found, it's not only a relativistic extension, but it's also a variant of this interpretation that can be uh, coined like possibilist. Uh, interpretation or variant of the uh, transactional interpretation. Um, so I'm very happy to have you here, and I hope that we will learn another, yet another interpretation today. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so let me just find out if there's any amplification or any. Can you hear me all right? Just okay. So. Um, I guess the way I'd like to proceed today is um, spend the first 50 minutes or so giving uh, a little PowerPoint overview of, of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, that overview is necessarily, I think, going to possibly leave you a little, you know, scratching your heads about some aspects or another. It's going to kind of be a quick little overview of certain things. Um, and then we'll, we'll have a little break, and then in the second part, I will go into some more detail on some of the features of the, the introductory PowerPoint in a little more depth. Um, what I'd also like to do is, um, you know, encourage people to raise your hand if I'm doing, if I'm presenting something and you feel really lost or you have a question, and you know, I, I'm happy to kind of take a minute to to address those as they arise since we have a lot of time and we, we can kind of relax and, and straighten any confusions out. Um, many times, um, you know, there, there are, as a philosopher, I've become aware of, of how semantics and term definitions are a huge issue um, in communicating <laughs> ideas. And in fact, um, my mother, who's a math educator, she's still, she's about 85 now and has about 20 times the energy I will ever have. Um, but one of her, one of the things she has noticed in, in teaching math is, is communication and having a common reference frame for the terminology we're using. And I mean, it, it may sound like a silly point, but it actually is, is crucial. So uh, if I'm sitting, you know, there are going to be many terms like measurement, absorber, emitter, um, atom, you know, things like this that we all have our own ideas about what these mean and they may serve as, as catch points for understanding. So anytime something like that comes up, you know, and you're, you're not getting it, please let me know. Um, I, I should also, you know, again, thank the organizers for inviting me. It's, it's a very generous invitation um, and I'm really excited to be here. This is my first time in Vienna. And um, I, I guess I, I should t possibly tell a, a silly joke that you've probably all heard, but um, what is a person who, what do you call a person who speaks three languages? And the answer is trilingual, or maybe Dutch, I don't know. Okay, and what is a person who speaks two languages? Bilingual. And what do you call a person who speaks one language? American. <laughs> so 
I apologize for, for that and our, you know, it's, uh, I, I speak a little French, but that doesn't help here. So, um, you know, it's just, it's just really exciting for me to be here. And in fact, the other thing I've, I've learned as uh, I've done a lot of online teaching in philosophy where you're dealing with a lot of writing intensive projects and, and a lot of grading. And I have found that in the US, we have many students who are learning English as a second language. And my big problem is Americans who need to learn English as a first language. So it's not a good situation. So anyway, um, let's just proceed with going through this overview. So um, basically what I'm going to introduce is I'm going to talk about the transactional interpretation, which was originally developed by John Kramer in the 1980s. Um, what I've done with tra the, trans the basic transactional interpretation is I've extended it to the relativistic domain. So I'm going to be talking about that today. Um, the, the transactional interpretation is a kind of a collapsed interpretation. And um, what may, many of you have been exposed to in a collapsed interpretation are theories such as the GRW theory, the Girardi, Green, Weber, um, explicit collapse theory, which um, uses a modification, a nonlinear modification of the Schrodinger equation to affect a kind of collapse. And they have several variants of that. Um, this is not anything like that, okay? It's not, we're not doing anything to the basic theory. We're not changing tra the transactional interpretation. It doesn't change the basic quantum theory. But what it does that's different, crucially different from the basic quantum theory is that it uses a different model of the way fields behave. So in a sense, um, you, you can, you know, the question is, is TI just an interpretation or is it actually a different theory? And that in itself is an interesting question because um, certainly at the non-relativistic level, it, it is basically an interpretation. It doesn't do anything different to the basic theory. However, arguably at the relativistic level, since the transactional picture uses a different theory of fields, it uses a different theory of the way fields behave, in a sense you can say, you know, if you want to be, be, be particular about it, that it's a different theory. However, it is empirically equivalent to the standard theory of fields and therefore to standard quantum mechanics. So it's important to kind of keep that in mind as we proceed that um, you may wonder, well, you know, if I'm going to be claiming to solve the measurement problem, which I am claiming to do, which nowadays if you say that people think, you know, you must be a crackpot. But so obviously we cannot do that in standard quantum theory. We all know if we're dealing with standard quantum theory understood as the unitary Schrodinger evolution, and that's basically it, other than you know an ad hoc collapse postulate, then clearly we do have a problem. And so what I'm gonna to try to persuade you today is that this different theory of fields enables you to define measurement. So it's a big claim, but you know, and, and again, the interesting point is that while it's a different theory of fields, it is empirically equivalent. So they boil down to basically the same quantum theory. Okay, so, so just to go back now and, and um, look at how TI originated, um, some of you may already know this, but it originated from this, this specific different theory of fields, is, is, has different names, some people call it the direct action theory, some people call it the absorber theory, and it was originally developed by Wheeler and Feynman, and they had their own reasons for developing it, which is another interesting historical and you know, interpretive topic that we may get into a little bit later. Um, what, what may not, what, what I think what people remember about the absorber theory, in my, in my you know, experience, is that Feynman turned away from it and Wheeler turned away from it, and therefore it must be wrong, it must be garbage because okay, these very smart guys turned away from it, okay? So actually, um, it, it isn't garbage, and they did have certain reasons for losing interest in it, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So uh, what I do note here on this first slide is that what people, while people tend to remember that Wheeler walked away from it, they do, they, it isn't as widely known that in 2003, together with, with his collaborator, uh, Wesley, 
he was re-advocating it. So again, if you're, you know, if you want to appeal to authority and, and, and kind of worry about whether, whether the, the geniuses have decreed that that theory is not worth considering, the fact that Wheeler came back to it in 2003 and said, we should consider this, he was actually proposing it as a, 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 a way forward in quantum gravity. But he did come back to it, and I, I have a quote from that paper later. So um, what I'm going to be talking about today is, is that what we can get out of the transactional approach is a natural derivation of the Born rule that emerges from the physics alone. And uh, what we'll see is that, um, in contrast to what is usually understood, that you know, it's usually the idea is usually prevalent that in order to talk about measurement, we have to go outside the, the theory. We have to go that the theory just does not allow for us to talk about measurement as a process that's occurring among the systems that are described by the theory. But in fact, in the direct action picture, in the transactional picture, you can do that. And the key is, is including absorber response. So we'll see how that works. And, um, and just emphasizing that this is a realist approach, but it's different from many of the realist approaches you may have already heard about. It does not add any, any hidden variables. It does not make any changes to the basic quantum theory. Okay, so just kind of a overview of what I'm going to talk about the first hour and um, whatever I don't get to, you know, we can take a little break and we'll pick up in the second hour. So I'm going to um, talk about what it is, what is TI, how TI explains the measurement process. Then the, on a philosophical um, consideration, we're going to talk about what, what kind of reality are we talking about in this picture, and we're going to be going back to Heisenberg's idea of potential. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the relativistic ex extension of the transactional picture, which I call RTI. Um, there's, a, there's a little ambiguity in the terminology because in my 2012 book I was calling this the possibleist transactional interpretation, so that was PTI, but they're basically the same thing. I call it RTI now just to emphasize that it's a relativistic picture. And then I'm going to talk about how we can understand that, that space-time is something that is emergent through the measurement process in, in this interpretation in RTI. Okay, so um, it was, uh, TI was introduced by John Kramer in the 1980s. This is the original reference, which he, he introduced the basics of the theory. Um, it's based on the wheeler feynman direct action theory or the absorber theory. Now, in this theory, the basic field propagation is time symmetric. So um, this is how that works. You can, and I have a few, a little bit of a diagram later that, I, that may help to visualize it. Um, it's the kind of thing that's really a little bit tricky to visualize just with you know the, the formal discussion. So we'll, we'll just look at some pictures in a minute. Um, but what they showed um, in the 1940s was they, well, basically they were not happy with the usual classical theory of electromagnetic radiation. The way that you had to um, get what you needed from the classical theory of, of electromagnetic radiation in, in which you assume that, as we see things, that, that charges emit a retarded field only, in other words, a ref, uh, only a future-directed field, which seems natural and common sense and seems to be what we observe, but they were not able to obtain the observed fact that charges lose energy when they emit this field. The way that they obtained that was by imposing this sort of ad hoc free field. This was Dirac's idea. And um, anyway, the, uh, actually, here's the quote that I was talking about earlier from, from Wheeler, um, where you can see that uh, Wheeler and his, and his colleague Wesley said that Wheeler Feynman swept the electromagnetic field from between the charged particles and replaced it with half retarded, half advanced direct interaction between particle and particle. It was the high point of this work to show that the standard and well-tested force of reaction of radiation on an accelerated charge is accounted for as the sum of the direct actions on that charge by all the charges of any distant complete absorber. And then he goes on and, and to laud with this approach, and it, it gives you all the correct uh, phenomena that you need but it doesn't actually assign any, any energy to the electromagnetic field as an independent entity, an independent object or system. And so this is, again, the, the usual 
radiation story that we get from the classical standard approach. It has these ad hoc features that, um, that it has a retarded field, um, but that you have to also have an additional assumption of this free field to get the radiative damping, to get the energy loss. Um, the other thing to kind of take note of is that a field, the field being generated, doesn't even have units of energy. It's, it's really only an amplitude. It has units of, of the square root of energy. So you need, clearly you need something more than just a charge generating a field to get this transfer of real energy. So the ways that they were approaching this was to assume a self-interaction that in the classical theory led to unwanted divergences, or you can impose this ad hoc free field that was Dirac's idea that just you don't know where it comes from or why it's there, but if you plot this in, then you get charges to lose energy. So, that, so it had this ad hoc nature, and that's what Wheeler and Feynman didn't like. So that was their, their motivation. Also their motivation was to avoid the self-interaction that in the classical field led to these infinities. So instead, what they said was, okay, so we're going to say that a charge, now here I'm adding that the, the objects that can radiate in this manner are bound excited states. And I'm calling, this is what I mean by an emitter. Okay, so, so take like an atom and, and an electron in an excited state in that atom. That's really what we mean by an emitter here. Um, and then other charges in bound states that can be excited to higher, um, to higher energy levels function as absorbers. And these are the, this is the new idea that comes with the absorber theory, that they in fact actively respond with their own time symmetric field. So then there's another assumption that through uh, history has been known as the light tight box condition that is the subject of some misunderstanding, which we can talk about here. But the, the object in blue there um, is the basically kind of a boundary condition that says that this, um, there is no total free field in the universe. In other words, there's no free field that's hanging out there that has no sources. So that's, that's what they call the light tight box condition. So the nice thing they saw is that if you assume that all charges emit with this time symmetric field, and then there is a response of absorbers that effectively kind of collectively adds to this free field whose total is always zero, meaning that whatever is emitted is always absorbed, then effectively you get what we see, you get a, a net retarded field. So they got, you know, what they wanted in that sense. And the other thing, well, okay, so here's just a picture uh, so you can kind of visualize what the idea is. This is, and the, these drawings are from the Davies, um, Paul Davies papers from the 1970s. Um, he also developed this theory into relativistic form. So this is what, if you think of the emitter and it, this is its world line, um, this is what the time symmetric field looks like. So it's got this discontinuity, it's got the retarded field, and then a phase change in the advanced field going into the past and that then. So then this is a free field that is actually based on responses of absorbers, and we'll see a little bit more how that works. And you see that if we superimpose them, we get only retarded fields because the advanced fields cancel out. So that's the basic idea. So meanwhile, the, the dividend here is that um, the, the nature of the advanced, the, the uh, field of the absorbers is such that it, it, its advanced component is exactly out of phase, as we saw in the picture, and it, it cancels the advanced field from the emitter. But the, meanwhile, this response field appears to be a free field, appears as if it's a free field from the vantage point of the emitter, and it does constitute this free field that had to be added in an ad hoc way in the standard theory. <clears throat> now this is what it looks like with, the, this is a picture from John Kramer's 1986 paper. So this is what it looks like with, the, with an absorber um, included, and this is just kind of in the idealized case of only one absorber. So this is, this is the case in which this field from the emitter is fully canceled by this total absorber. And what we get is we get the advanced field canceled to the past of the emitter. We also get the retarded field canceled to the future of the absorber, which is really what we mean by absorption. Okay, so this explains why the energy go, and it's a retarded field that 
that is left. And meanwhile, this explains why the energy goes from the emitter to the absorber, and these two fields are reinforced here. So that's the basic transactional picture. Now, um, this is just a way to kind of see uh, in a more formal way how we get what looks like a free field acting on the emitter if we consider just um, take out this one emitter that we call J and don't include it in the uh, fields because the idea is that it's not experiencing, it's, this is the field acting on that emitter as opposed to the total field. So the field acting on it, if we assume that it doesn't interact with its own field, so we, dis, we take it out of the sum, it's all of these time symmetric fields, but then we include the total, again this is zero, but we, we added it, this is the total response from all absorbers, and what we get is effectively a net retarded field from all the uh, absorbers, all the uh, other charges not equal to the one we're singling out, plus what looks like an advanced field with respect to that one charge that we're singling out. So, so the idea is that the absorber theory very nicely gives you the um, classical radiation theory and the, the free field that explains why a charge loses energy but in fact doesn't um, require any kind of ad hoc imposition of this free field. Okay, so that's the, the basics of the uh, Wheeler-Feynman picture that underlies the transactional interpretation. So now I'm going to get into some of the specifics and the terminology that, that we use in the transactional picture. Um, according to Kramer, this, these are his definitions. So if we look only at the, uh, let me just go back for a second, and if we uh, in practice look only at the retarded field from the emitter, which is our red line here, and that, that's kind of just that component, the forward component from the emitter, which is the one we know about, okay? So we can call that an offer wave, and that corresponds to the usual quantum state. Now, um, meanwhile, the new thing, the new ingredient that's added by the Wheeler-Feynman picture, the transactional picture, is that an absorber, absorbers are going to respond to this, and we can get into this question of well, why, did it, why do they respond and how do you know when something's responding you know, in the relativistic version. But for now, the basic idea is that when we're looking at um, the total system of emitter and potential absorbers, when we get responses, they are, um, they are what constitute uh, a bra in the, in the bra cat notation, and that's called a confirmation wave. Now, of course, this is not part of standard quantum theory. However, we, go, we have these objects in the theory already, so the nice thing about it is that TI is giving you something physically going on, it's a, you know, a referent for what we already have in the theory, we have ob objects like this in the theory, so it's not adding anything ad hoc to the theory. So we can think of this interaction of the offer and the confirmation as a kind of a, a, a handshake, um, and in general, one offer wave will set up many uh, of these responses because many absorbers will respond. And, and I call these, each of these handshakes an incipient transaction because there are many of them and we don't know, you know which one's going to be actualized. So I call them incipient transactions at this stage. Now at the point where one of these is actualized, that's where we get real energy transferring from the emitter to the absorber that sort of wins that, that competition. So we'll, we'll see how, in more detail how that works in a little bit. Okay, so this is, this is, again, that same picture. So we have the offer wave. We have responses here. I'm only showing one response, but the, in the next slides we'll get to situations where we have several absorbers. So we get this um, offer and response, and just once again we get cancellation to the past of the emitter, cancellation to the future. We get a real quantum of energy going from the emitter to the absorber. So the completed transaction looks like this, just emphasizing that we've got energy that was in the excited state of that atom, then the energy left that atom and was picked up by the absorbing atom that, that actually won that competition. So the other interesting thing is that what we get out of this is that the, the reinforced field is really two complex fields. This, this goes back to the, this is the retarded field from the emitter. This is the advanced field from the absorber. And the reinforcement 
is really this, this um, addition in which they become a, the fully real cosine function. So that's the other aspect in which the quantum case differs from the classical case because the independently these fields are complex objects, which is kind of one of one of the other puzzles of quantum theory is that the the uh, de Broglie wave and so on that the offer waves or the quantum states truly are complex, and this explains how the complexity takes both the retarded complex form, the advanced complex form, to give you the real form that constitutes the real energy. Now, meanwhile, if you look at the amplitudes of these, and we'll see this in more detail later, um, if you look at the product of the amplitudes, we clearly get this from the advanced state, this is from the retarded state, and that's how we get our, our natural physical explanation for the Born rule. And I'll talk about that more later. So this is a, an example of the case, more, more typical case where we have many possible detectors, absorbers, uh, we have um, an emitting source. So this is how, it, how it's kind of applied, the formalism is applied where we have an offer wave. The, the component that is absorbed by the detector C is the projection of S onto C. And then what, so the response that that absorber generates then is the advanced, uh, the advanced form of this. So we get this. This is the actual confirmation that is sent back to the emitter. And then of course, similarly with D, so if, again, if we look at absorber C, the, the incipient transaction between the emitter and absorber C, we take the product of those two amplitudes, and that gives us the Born rule for the probability of the outcome C. Okay, so, um, so now we're going to um, look a little bit more specifically at von Neumann's theory of measurement and see how TI explains that quite nicely. So, I'm, you know, I'm sure you all know this, but just for review purposes. So, von Neumann's formulation specified these two processes. The numbers are, you know, a little counterintuitive, but process two, he called the basic unitary evolution of the Schrodinger picture, in which, in, in which picture the Schrodinger uh, state evolves with time and is the solution to the Schrodinger equation. And it's deterministic and reversible and so on. Then process one is this non-unitary collapse that has been ad hoc in the theory. It's indeterministic and it's irreversible. And so he called this the measurement transition and he formalized it um, in this way. That, let me see if I have a better, well, I'll get to the way he formalized it, it you know, in a few slides. But, you know, as you probably also know, he, this is part of the, this is the measurement problem where he said, well, clearly there seems to be some sort of a non-unitary process going on because our, our quantum theory is, we thought, is deterministic, it's process two. But when we look at things, we always see deterministic results, so, and we see them with this probability, which corresponds to some indeterministic process, and who knows what that is and how that happens. So he, he talked about consciousness. So here was kind of born the resort to an external observing consciousness that a lot of people, you know, has, be, has become very mainstream. Okay, no comment, okay. So, um, so back to this um, specific uh, case of the, of the interferometer, we can see that we get the Born rule from that. Um, if we just take the whole object and just take their product, so we've got this, this sort of a ket thing and a bra thing with each with their amplitudes. The product gives you this weighted projection operator where the weight is the Born rule. So once again, and that's basically von Neumann's process one, uh, although he sums them all up. So we'll see that he, he's got a sum, he's got a mixed state, you know, because he sums up all these possible outcomes as weighted projection operators. Here's just another way to kind of visualize how we get this, this product out of it, you know, you might say, well, why are we multiplying these things? Um, it is really kind of a, 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 a situation where we have successive attenuations. We've got the source emitting this offer wave, then we've got some sort of a filter uh, that tells us that not all that offer wave is going to get to this detector, only this part of it, only the component that is projected onto that state. So that's the only thing that detector sees. So the absorbers in that detector emit, uh, generate the advanced form of 
what it is they received, which looks like this. When this object interacts with the emitter, once again, the emitter can only detect, only, only receive this state. So we have to project the, this bra onto that state. And so this is where we get this second um, complex conjugate factor. So this is where our product comes from. It's sort of this circuit, which is kind of a heuristic way to, to picture what's going on. So, so this is more, of, more formally now how this gives us von Neumann's process one. This is how he formalized it. He said, well, we start with a pure state, and then somehow we have this non-unitary process one in which we end up with this set of weighted projection operators, which is a mixed state that can be interpreted epistemically. In other words, it's a proper mixed state. It's not something that you get by tracing over, you know, degrees of freedom we're not interested in <clears throat> or something like that. So it's, um, it's a situation in which when you have this mixed state, you can tell that a measurement has occurred. And in TI, this is kind of another way to picture how that process one has, has occurred. We have this offer components there uh, going to each of these different possible absorbers and the generated confirmations. And, and you know, that's just a nice handy way to visualize what these projection operators and their weights correspond to it. These are what I call incipient transactions. So in this case, we've had the measurement transition. Now, you can think of the, of the von Neumann process as having kind of two stages that are both interesting in, in their, and maybe you know, a challenging in their own way. The first challenge is to explain how we get from a pure state that just undergoes deterministic evolution and leads to the Schrodinger cat problem if you just you know, keep going with the unitarity. <laughs> To, to, to save the, you know, the cat from being in a superposition, we can actually say that, well, there, there are absorbers in the Geiger counter, and they really did something, and they really did generate physically these, these uh, confirming responses that gave us this trans measurement transition. But now, okay, stage one, so I've gotten a set of competing incipient transactions. Well, you can think of it as kind of a lottery, um, and, and there's no way to say, uh, in a deterministic, you know, you can't give a mechanism for why uh, you get like outcome one or outcome two or outcome three. You can't say there's any causal reason or, or anything like that. Um, the way I deal with this in TI is to say, well, this is very analogous to spontaneous symmetry breaking. And we have spontaneous symmetry breaking elsewhere in physics with the Higgs mechanism and, and situations like that where where the, the theory will give us many solutions for a given initial situation, and there's no causal mechanism for why nature ends up in one of those solutions. This is kind of an ubiquitous feature of, of physics, really, and so that's why I wanna, you know, when people say, ah, but you know, you failed to, because you couldn't tell us why one of these became actualized as opposed to the other. Well, you know, if, if TI fails on that, then so does the Higgs mechanism and, and so do any other cases in physics that rely on a spontaneous symmetry breaking. So that, that's kind of where we are with this. We get, we get one, one of these outcomes is actualized. And at that point, the real quantum of energy will go from the emitter to whichever one of these absorbing systems wins that lottery and actualizes that, that quantum. Yeah. So just to summarize, so um, what we already talked about here, the process one leads to a weighted set of competing incipient transactions, and each of those is represented physically by a projection operator multiplied by the Born rule, which gives us a nice physical referent for the measurement transition and, and his process one. So that's, that's how we get the process one, by the responses of absorbers, and, and I already talked about the spontaneous symmetry breaking. Um, okay, so we kind of already dealt with this. And now, and I'll, I'll return to that a little bit. So in this section, I'm going to start dealing a little bit with um, what does reality look like in this picture if we take seriously the complexity of the quantum states and so on, and, and as you all know, the fact that, that Hilbert spaces can have arbitrarily many dimensions and, and so on. Um, clearly, we're, we're, we've got to be talking about something, um, something interesting here. The, the usual case, if you had a single quantum only and you looked at its wave function, then you could think of this as being a space-time object. 
And in fact, that's what Kramer was doing in his original 1986 paper. He was, he was actually claiming that the quantum state is real and it's a space-time object. But the minute you get into these composite systems of, of more than one uh, degree of freedom, that, ha that each of which has three n, so you have n systems, each of which has three spatial degrees of freedom. So you've got three n spatial degrees of freedom. Well, this doesn't fit into space-time, so we just have to kind of face up to that, um, that it, it does not fit into space-time. So how do we deal with that? Well, um, it's not really that new an idea. Um, Heisenberg was, was proposing the idea of possibility or quantum potentia as being something real. So what I'm proposing then is that um, the classical realm, the, the observable phenomenal realm that is well described by classical physics is really just the tip of the iceberg. So this, the tip represents space-time. And uh, you know, the big challenge is that it's kind of, a um, strong word maybe, it's kind of an atrocity to, to say to a physicist, oh, you know, there are things that are, that are real but don't fit into space-time. You know, it's, it's just kind of a weird thing to say um, for many physicists uh, because physics, you know, to, to give it credit, physics is an empirical science and it doesn't countenance anyone's flight of fancy about the way they want reality to be. And you have to be able to make contact with phenomenal, with the empirical world. And so that's, you know, the power of physics in that whatever theory you dream up, you've got to be able to test it, you've got to be able to corroborate it and show in, in space and time, and show at least on the tip of the iceberg that your theory is doing something and it connects with nature, it connects with reality. Otherwise, why should anyone listen to you? And I'm all for that. Okay, but, but what I want to argue, and you know, others have, have said this too, I guess I'm not the only one, is that quantum theory is arguably in its structure, in its formal structure, and the fact that as we saw you know, in the previous slide, we've got composite quantum systems that have three n spatial degrees of freedom. Well, we don't have three n sp spatial dimensions. So I'm just gonna suggest that they are real, but they're just, they're just not, they're sub-empirical so that the reality is just bigger than we thought, and quantum theory is kind of a finger that's pointing outside what we grew up, what we all grew up with as, you know, I live in a space-time container. You know, we all think we live in a space-time container, and that's it, and that's what's real. And what I'm suggesting is quantum theory is telling us that may not be the case. Okay, so, so that's what I just basically said. Okay, so the proposal is to take quantum entities as physically real, but having a different ontological status from space-time objects, called, call them potentia, and the plurals potentiae, you know, if you, for those Latin scholars, okay. So, so, and this is really goes back to Heisenberg, who said that a quantum system is something standing in the middle between the idea of an event and the actual event, a strange kind of physical reality just in the middle between possibility and reality. So I think, you know, he's really onto something there, and I want to take that seriously. Um, I've also uh, recently written a paper with Stu Kaufman and Mike Epperson where we, we go into some detail about what, why we should take Heisenberg's idea seriously, and I can, anyone who's interested, I can give you that reference. So, um, so the idea then in, in my extension of TI, which I called possibilist TI, and I, now I call relativistic TI, <laughs> what are these offers and confirmations? They're, they're physical possibilities in Heisenberg's sense, potentiae. The realm of the quantum potentiae is what is described by Hilbert space, or at the relativistic level, Fox space. <clears throat> and in addition, those offer confirmation exchanges that set up the incipient transactions are also a form of potentiae. <clears throat> um, okay, so what I'm saying here is that Actually, when you get your mixed state, when you get your set of incipient transactions that is described by uh, that sum, that's where you can kind of mark the trans transition between the possible and the actual, because we're, we've at least, now we can define a classical probability space. So at this stage, you've got, you've got a particular basis. The absorption responses, the absorber responses have defined for you a particular basis. And that, with, with respect to that one basis, you can define a classical probability space. 
So that tells you you're about to be able to, um, to uh, transition from the quantum realm to, to the, the so-called tip of the iceberg at that point. All right, so um, as I just noticed, okay, so the measurement basis is defined by those absorbers, and it gives you that process one. And as I already talked about this, it's just kind of a, a quick looking back at the um, actualization of one of those outcomes, again, a form of spontaneous symmetry breaking, which you can think of as a generalization of the usual symmetry breaking in that it's weighted. So that's how it's distinct from, from other cases such as in the Higgs mechanism. This is a weighted form of symmetry breaking. So some, you know, some outcomes are more likely than others, but yet there's no causal story about why or how one of those gets actualized. Um, so this is a kind of a, a you know, counterintuitive idea. So we, we could just go back to the, the case of Burden's ass, which is a way of calling, you know, kind of um, making an amusing sort of comment on this principle of sufficient reason that, that underlies our thinking due to Leibniz, where we, we kind of want to know, well, you have to tell me why this happened and not something else, or in its stronger form, you can't have something happen unless you can provide a causal mechanistic reason, a basis for that thing happening. And so, you know, possibly what, what this faces us with is the idea that perhaps nature violates this principle. Now, another possibility is that maybe we have to deal with volition in nature. I'm not going to get into that in this talk, but it's an intriguing question. And I've talked about, you know, that, uh, that possibility as an opportunity for free will, which is another a big, big problem. But, you know, the idea is this donkey doesn't really care about, perhaps, let me say, perhaps this donkey doesn't really care about Leibniz's intuitions or our intuitions. It's hungry, so it's just going to start eating, and it doesn't have to give you a reason. So maybe nature's like that, too. All right. So um, let's see. Who are we doing? Okay, great. Okay, so I'll just get into this next part where I'm going to talk a little bit more about the relativistic extension of the transactional picture. Um, this, this is how I have extended the, the transactional picture, and it's based on a very nice work by Davies. Um, the tragedy is that, that Professor Davies thinks that Wheeler said don't do this, so he doesn't want to do it either. <laughs> it's like, okay, so I actually visited Professor Davies and told him, hey, you solved the measurement problem back in 1971. This is great, you know, you're a hero in direct action theory, and he, he's just want to deal with it, uh, and it's a shame because don't be like that. It's fine, there's nothing wrong with it. Okay, so, so I understand skepticism about the absorber theory, about the direct action theory, perfectly legit, but it's, if it's because Feynman and Wheeler turned away from it, then re please reconsider that because again, Wheeler was reconsidering. So th this, is, this is work that uh, I should start out by saying I'm, I am self-taught in quantum field theory, um, there are gaps in my knowledge, and I'm sure that many of you probably know more about it than I do. So that is great, and please feel free to, you know, let me know what I'm mistaken about. If you see something, then I can fix it. However, you know, what I'm going to do is go over Davies' formulation, and what he noted was that, uh, and this is pretty standard actually, that what we call the Feynman propagator which is a very you know, standard object in quantum field theory that describes um, you know, virtual particle propagation and so on um, in, in a causal way, and what Feynman wanted to be a causal way that made intuitive sense. And it turns out that this Feynman, and I can get into more detail about how these things are defined, but just as an overview, the Feynman propagator of quantum field theory is actually can be decomposed, as, as Davies noted, into a time symmetric propagator and a free field with positive for positive energies. So this is actually the quantum analog of the what we saw before with a retarded field being a sum of the time symmetric field and an, and this free field that summed to zero. So the, this is basically the quantum analog of that in the um, and we'll see that that comes out of the absorber theory. But this is actually how the Feynman propagator can be decomposed. And one thing that it does is it actually kind of deals with two cases in one. It deals with virtual particles, virtual photons, and also real photons. 
And what, um, what the relativistic development of TI does is it, it disambiguates these cases and it allows you to say at what point you're dealing with a real photon and in what case you're dealing with um, a vir virtual photon. And just long story short, it is that when you have a, a situation that can be described only with this time symmetric component, you have virtual photon propagation only. And when you have a situation that is described by this free field component, then you have real photon propagation. So we'll, we'll see that that's, that's one of the developments in the um, RTI. Okay, so I mean, and basically how that got started is that Davies noted in his work that virtual processes, virtual particle processes are described by just this time symmetric part. Basically the time symmetric propagator just has um, positive energies propagating into the future, negative energies propagating into the future, positive energies propagating into the past, and negative energies propagating into the past. And it has a discontinuity at the particle world line because this is what it means for it to be a bound field or at least you know not a free field. Technically a solution to the inhomogeneous equation. So that's basically what the time symmetric propagator is. It's, it's actually a time isotropic propagator. So everything's going in any direction it can. Okay, so the, um, the next aspect of what we're going to look at here is, that's key, I think, for, for getting TI from the non-relativistic to the relativistic domain is to explain this issue of, well, why are you going to get, why and how are you going to get an offer wave? Why and how and at what point are you going to get a confirmation wave, as, as uh, Kramer calls them? Well, to, to answer this, we need to go back to the, go to the relativistic level and just consider kind of a standard scattering picture where we've got, say, an electron, two electrons scattering, and we've got a virtual photon going between them. Well, in the direct action absorber theory, this process can be described by the time symmetric propagator. And it's nice because, you know, the Feynman propagator wants to allow for cases where, uh, if you think of, of a photon as its own antiparticle, but just to, to worry about, you know, if, well, we've, we've got, uh, if, if it goes from here to here, it better be a particle. If, that's be, if this time is before that time, we got to assign times to everything, okay? So suppose this time was before that time, then the Feynman propagator says, well, I better make sure this is a positive energy particle going from there to there. If, on the other hand, the virtual quantum is going from there to there, then I better make it a negative energy particle because I want to make sure that only positive energy goes forward. And it's all this bookkeeping that you have to do with the Feynman propagator. With the time symmetric propagator, that's all taken care of because you don't have to specify. There's actually no fact of the matter about which way the energy is going if you're just going to say, well, you know, I'm going to be summing over all these possible space-time positions anyway. So you don't have to do this kind of bookkeeping. And, the, and it's, it's already known that there's an ambiguity at the level of virtual particles about which temporal direction you're going in. We never know, and so the Feynman propagator has to allow for both cases and try to impose causality on it. But with just the time symmetric propagator, we automatically get the physical statement that we don't know which way this virtual photon is going. And that's the way they are. So it's just it's kind of a nice, I think, elegant way of describing that. So in any case, so, so what you get with this kind of interaction, this virtual interaction is, I like to think of it as a necessary but not sufficient condition to have an offer wave or a confirmation wave. Um, so what is it that is this sufficient condition? Well, um, what we have, for one thing, you have to have certain things, like you have to have the satisfaction of conservation laws, in, for, <laughs> if, for which you're going to need these things to be, at least be loosely bound. So they have to be, once again, in a bound state, such as an atom. Um, so now we can think, OK, in relative, the, the transition point between the non-relativistic transactional picture, we think of it like, like a coin flip. It's just either or, two possibilities. There's either a quantum state there, or there isn't a quantum state, one or the other. But when you go to the relativistic domain, in a way, metaphorically, what you've got is another option. You've got like a thicker coin where, where you can have a process where it's non-committal. There's an interaction, but there's no fact of the matter. You know, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no, yes, I've got an offer wave, yes, I've got a confirmation wave. It's something in between, and that's, that's how to, picture what are these couplings here. 
what are these couplings where you've got a connection between the electrons and this is a virtual photon. So that's like the coin landing on its side at the relativistic level, something that the non-relativistic theory cannot account for. So now we go to the fact that there are coupling amplitudes that characterize these, these, these contact points. It's the, basically the electric charge E. So each of the, these couplings are, is an amplitude. It's an amplitude, and as Feynman said, uh, I'll have this later on, Feynman actually pointed out that E, the charge, is the amplitude for a real photon to be emitted or absorbed. So what the relativistic TI does is it takes that and it says, yes, that's exactly what that is. And what that means is it quantifies the probability, and they multiply because it's a mutual thing. The, the probability that you will get an offer and a confirmation is E times E, or the fine structure constant, you know, with the pro appropriate, appropriate normalizations and so on, there's factors of H and C, but basically E squared is the fine structure constant, and that quantifies the probability that in, in this kind of interaction, provided that other conservation laws are satisfied and so on, you can get, and say, an offer emitted at Y by this, this electron, and I've doubled them to note now that they're bound states, because you can't do this with free electrons, it violates energy conservation. So um, let's see, I've got, I've got a, an offer, okay, I've got an offer coming from X and a confirmation coming from Y. So that this is probabilistically, uh, it, it's, it's um, quantitatively defined, but it's probabilistic again. So um, that is, that's kind of an important point in which we can say that um, an absorber and emitter is, is well defined in terms of what uh, what is what instigates this process of offer and confirmation generation? So I'm going to uh, stop there because you know it's kind of hot and some of you are about to faint. So we'll just pause and, and maybe have a little ten minute break and get a little throw some ice on your head and pick it up in a few minutes. And are there any immediate questions? Well, you can wait till after. So yeah. Um, I have one way. Um, well, well, this is what tells you. Um, I mean, and I, so we can get more into that, and it's a great question in the second part, but so you still want to know, okay, well, what you said doesn't answer for me uh, at what point absorption occurs. And because absorption, response of absorbers, is what triggers this von Neumann non-unitary transition. So, so then the question is, I mean, I think many people are skeptical about this. What they say is, oh, fine, you give me this story about absorbers, blah, 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 but you don't know what an absorber is, so that's just, you know, so I'm, I'm just, you know, caricaturing. But, but that's a natural concern because we've been taught that no matter what you say, you will never define measurement, you know. But what I claim is, yes, we are, we are defining measurement here. It's indeterministic. It's an indeterministic account. So I'm never going to be able to say, you know, at t equals, you know, whatever time point, you know, 001 seconds, a, you will have a confirmation and you will have process one. But we have decay, actually decay probabilities, which are part of standard physics. And in this theory, they give, they give time-dependent probabilities. That's standard physics. And in this theory, those give you the probability that the measurement transition will occur. For a particular system, so we can talk. It's a great question. We can talk more about it. Can, can I try to rephrase like this question? Yeah. If I enter in the lab, can you pinpoint what the observer is and what is not an observer, or is it a, like is a fundamental distinction between objects and the observer and those that are no. not observer? No, we don't. Something? We don't need to talk about observers or anything. So I'll get into that in the second part. So everything is a, a system, and. We as observers, when we observe something determine it, it's because there was something determined. So we're, determ we're, we're observing something that really did happen already on a microscopic scale, and we don't need to have any fancy theory of the observer. All we have to say is, 
we got to the, some process occurred that plopped us onto the tip of the iceberg. And the tip of the iceberg is what our senses can see, detect as phenomena. So it's on the tip of the iceberg, and therefore we can phenomenally perceive it, just the way it is. So there's no, there's no need to say an observer is as opposed to, you know, anything like that. But we can get more to that. Yeah. I'm yeah, a Kantian philosopher here, so I was wondering, in line with what you just said, uh, if uh, the domain of quantum theory, which is submerged, but very real, or the, the relativistic domain of that would be, so to speak, the equivalent of Kant's world of things in themselves. Yes, exactly. If I understood your question, I would I would make that identification with the, the tip of the iceberg being the world of appearance, Kant's ph phenomenal yeah. world, yeah. and the the submerged portion being eligible to count as noumenon, new, Kant's noumenal world, because because it is you know things in themselves, in a sense that but in a, such a way that they are not observed, they can't they can't be observed. But that they are there, and, and actually, quantum theory can point to them and tell us something about them. So it's a, it's a great question in that I disagree with Kant in, in the sense that he he said that noumena are are intrinsically unknowable because the way he defined knowledge was through sense experience only. He ruled out the idea that an intellectual, rational exploration could give you knowledge about something. But I think that's what quantum theory is doing. So. Uh, let's see, I guess you can share. So, well, I'd like to raise an issue with, uh, concerning uh, this relativistic uh, thing you about. So you, you, you base your discussion, it's, it's very, very natural, of course, on, on quantum electrodynamics and on, on the uh, perturbative uh, way of, of studying that. Uh, so it's granted, of course, he is uh, so far uh, really the only way one can really get uh, results. But one shouldn't forget that uh, uh, perturbation theory is uh, just one uh, man made way of approximation. And there are many, many other, I mean, one, one can study them in, in the theories which are, of course, non relativistic, but also relativistic theories. Lower dimensions, uh, and you are discussing some questions of principles. So, mm -hmm. so one could also uh, study models in the lower dimensions, maybe. You might be. And uh, so I'm maybe warning against uh, attaching too much uh, reality to, uh, to these uh, diagrams. I mean, they are sure. just uh, a convenient tool, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. one sees it from uh, the other theories that are many, many other ways of. Getting the numerical results, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, so for for instance, this this uh, the concept of virtual particles. It may not be uh, a meaningful concept uh, beyond uh, this perturbation theory. So also, mm -hmm. I think uh, be aware of this and not so to base uh, really a whole uh, theory of interpretation or, or, a, or a new other concept. So one has to be aware that uh, the perturbation theory is just one way of studying. Sure. Well, a great point, and I, I do get your your concern, and I you know I, I do take that seriously. And of course, these pictures are are kind of heuristic entryways. They're not meant to be taken literally. Of course, we know there are many, many other diagrams, the infinite, you know, and should we reify the perturbation expansion? Well, that's a that's a great question. Um, However, I guess I would also say that the, the direct action theory of fields arguably doesn't rest on any particular approach, including the perturbative approach. That I think it, it, it's a theory of fields that goes deeper than that, in the sense that you could talk about um, correlation functions if you want to be a little bit more general, perhaps. And um, it's a you know it's a question of well, what are these fields if, if there are these are two-point correlations that, you know, if you have a, what you call virtual particle, we don't necessarily want to think of it as the little corpuscle plopping along, which I certainly don't. It's really not. It's, it's more of a connection. And, and one, of, one of the things that people didn't like about the direct action theory is that these connections are non-local. They, um, they don't involve a, a kind of uh, causal 
notion of energy propagation by way of a field with independent degrees of freedom, and that made a lot of people uncomfortable because they were explicitly non-local. So uh, again, the way that the, the actual mechanistic way in which these processes work, I'm kind of agnostic on that. I don't want to, you know, cling to any particular visualization or model of how these processes work. I don't claim to, to know that. But if we think of the direct action theory as in a kind of structural realist way, that, that something about it captures this, at least the structural behavior of, of reality at a level that, that arguably is pre-empirical, you know, not is sub-empirical, then at least um, the, the descriptions that we use for these processes in, as formulated in the theory do seem to give a nice correspondence with um, you know, the von Neumann measurement transition and so on. So I, it's, it's a great point that we don't want to get fixated on you know, particular visualizations. So, but I guess let's take a little 10 minute break and, and get a little refreshment. <laughs> I think um, since we just kind of were, were dealing with the issue of um, at what point are we getting these processes, in other words, responses of absorbers that I've argued tell you that you have the measurement transition occurring, um, we can kind of see what it looks like here. You can see that as opposed to a, a simple scattering, which is in the direct action theory, it, it's just the... The, um, the direct connection, it's you know, a virtual photon if you want to think of it that way, but there's no, this is no, this is, remains unitary. So the idea is when you have this kind of process going on at this level, the, the uh, evolution is still unitary. Nothing has happened that would precipitate what we call the measurement transition or the non-unitary transition. Now at this point, this, this depicts a situation where the non-unitary transition is occurring because we're getting an absorber response and we're getting an offer wave, an offer and confirmation. And the doubling of the photon line represents real energy transfer. So the claim is that at the relativistic level in the transactional picture, you can really distinguish between a simple scattering that's a, a non-unitary, that's a unitary process, excuse me, unitary, that, that this is, there's no measurement occurring in this kind of process. Whereas in this process, whether or not it's microscopic, it, it nevertheless, a process has occurred, um, emission and absorber response, that has now triggered this non-unitary process. So this is a very unfamiliar idea, and especially the idea that, that this is, happens at the micro level. So we don't need to bring in any observers, or we don't have to define anything that's macroscopic, although we can, we can actually use this, um, this account to get an, an account of why certain systems can be called macroscopic and others are microscopic. But nevertheless, the transition can occur at this microscopic level. So I'm going to go into a little more quantitative detail now. Can, if I scribble on this board, we would be able to see it? Okay. Um, so, so we're just going, this is all standard physics, um, but we're going to be interpreting it in the direct action picture. So um, a very standard uh, quantity in physics is the transition amplitude between two states uh, where you have state B, which is an excited state for some atomic system, some atomic electron, and we also have a state of the, the photon field, the EM field, in which we have n minus one photons in the field, indicating that one got absorbed. And the matrix element for this process is we have an interaction Hamiltonian, that involves the vector potential, the electromagnetic potential, and the particle's momentum. It looks like this. Just if you're interested, uh, there's got there's a coupling amplitude here, some units here, and we've got a electromagnetic field dot p of the electron. Okay, so that's the, the uh, interaction Hamiltonian that can affect this transition, and then the initial state is the uh, let's see, the ground state of the atom and a state of the field, the photon field with an electron. So this is a matrix element for absorption. Um, so uh, when we look at this, you know, the standard thing, standard way to deal with this 
is to um, look at the, uh, there's also a time dependence that goes along with this. I guess I'll write that out now. Um, so basically this, the time dependence looks like, you know, integrating zero to t tau. You have the difference between the two energy levels, which I'm going to call, so I can't believe I write it, I am AT. And the frequency of the photon. Okay, so that you have a time dependence that looks like that. So the standard way to get the probability for absorption is to apply the Born rule to this and square it. And what you get is a time dependent probability that if you have any particular atom in this state exposed to an electromagnetic field, it will in fact absorb a photon. Okay. So that's very standard physics, and that's how I want to emphasize that absorption in TI is nothing more than this. Okay, that, that's how things absorb, and that's the theory that describes their absorption. Now, what, um, what the transactional picture contributes to this is the idea that, uh, here's this little absorber sitting out here, okay? I'm gonna call it G, because it's in its ground state. Well, that, that absorber doesn't do anything unless there is another system, an atom in an excited state, that could emit a photon. So, um, you know, in standard theory, Photons are thought of as pre, you know, just autonomous objects that you can send out a photon and there it goes and it's unilateral. Or you can unilaterally absorb a photon because it was just always there. Okay? So that doesn't happen in the transactional picture. In the direct action picture, there are no photons unless you have at least two systems like this that can interact and they're already, they already know about each other in this virtual sense. So they're already uh, involved in this direct action. However, in, in virtue of that direct interaction, they, they may know, and I'm saying no in a, just a loose way, I don't really think they're little people thinking, okay, but, but they, they have a, a, a way of, of ex acquiring information, let's say, that this that that you could satisfy energy conservation if energy if this thing lost energy and this thing gained it. So there's at least a a, a, necess, um, a necessary but not sufficient condition here for an emission and absorption to take place. And the whole point of the direct action picture is you always have both. Okay, so any real photon for any real I'm going to there's our photon gamma any real photon requires an emitter and at least one absorber. Otherwise, nothing happens, there are no photons. Okay, an absorber, again, is just a bound state that is capable of being excited to a higher energy level state. The emitter is just a bound system that is capable of falling down to a lower energy state. That's all they are, just as in standard physics. So instead of having to square this, the way we explain that a real photon was created in the transactional picture is we take the transition amplitude for absorption, which is already here, and then we consider also that in order for that photon to exist, it must also be emitted, okay? We can't just absorb it. So the emitted part looks like, um, you know, it's actually the opposite, so, um, let's see. And interaction Hamiltonian, and then P and minus one, because since in this initial state it's in a lower energy state, it hasn't. Um, I mean, it's sorry, it's in a higher energy state, capable of emitting a photon, but there are fewer photons in the field because one hasn't been emitted yet. So th this is the absorption matrix element. This is the emission matrix element. And, and it's going to have a time dependence that looks like, uh, let's integrate this, tau, that's I, omega t, where that's the, the difference in the two energy levels, and then e to the, I can't read my writing, let's see this one. Yeah, e to the i omega t. Okay, so the, 
so what we see is the um, the transition problem, the transition amplitude for the emission part is already the complex conjugate of the absorption part, and we can work out the, the final result if we want to. Um, basically, so the probability that you're going to get this photon to be emitted, gamma, which I'm saying has uh, k, frequency k, just call it k, probably it's going to exist at all, is multiplying the amplitudes for two, the two processes that are required, absorption, emission, and then when we do the integrations, it, it turns out you know, that we get something like this. They are complex conjugates of each other. It's something like a EBI over T minus omega K delta L omega rather minus one over R minus omega K. Sorry, my writing's off. And they're complex conjugates, so it's squared. And so basically, if you you know work work that out, this ends up being a sharply peaked function, and for large times it approaches a delta function, and you just get Fermi's golden rule. So what you get out of this, and you could look this up in Sakurai or you know any reference that deals with with emission and absorption radiative processes. So you get Fermi's golden rule. Now you usually get it from squaring, applying the Born rule ad hoc to either the absorption transition element with its time dependence or the emission one. And you say, I'm going to get the probability for absorption because that's what I'm interested in, or I'm going to get the probability for emission because that's what I'm interested in. Well, the direct action picture says you have to be interested in both of them because they're both required in order for you to get a photon at all. So, so the proper way to take them into account is multiply their amplitudes together and lo and behold, when you get that, you've got Fermi's golden rule and you've got the Born rule, just by multiplying these two amplitudes that are complex conjugates of each other. So that's what I mean when I say, you know, that this picture just hands you the Born rule on a silver platter, as long as you take into account that um, in order to have radiation, there must be emission and absorption. So, so the idea is, what we get from this is a time-dependent probability. These are just decay probabilities. These are standard objects in physics. Decay probabilities, at least for the excited case or absorption probabilities, if you're only looking at you know, either emission or absorption. Um, so, you, so they're standard objects in physics. And so it turns out that because what this is really describing is the generation of a real photon. In other words, you've got an offer. This counts as the probability to have an offer wave. This counts as the probability to get a conformation wave. Oh, I'm sorry, I did it backwards. Okay, so this was absorption is our CWR confirmation. I'm going the other way. Okay, so that the absorption gives us our confirmation wave. This gives us our offer wave. And and so we this is telling us that the probabilities we're getting out of this are are actually describing the probability at any particular time that you'll get this that you will get your confirmation and your offer, which is the non-unitary transition. Yes? Uh, you need a bit more right, to get actual detail, so that... Yes, you definitely do. Yeah, you definitely do. This, this is, um, this, if you take the limit of large t, you know, I'm not going to claim to derive for you in complete detail the um, Fermi's golden rule, but for large t, this, is a, this approach is something like t times uh, a delta function of um, delta omega minus h bar omega k. So I'm not going to work that all out here, but it, you know it's a standard result, and you can look it up in Sakurai or anything like that. So so but so there there's this thing squared. So there's the transition amplitude squared, which is that basic probability of the transition with these two products. Okay, and then you've got this delta function, and so this turns out to be, this quantity is really a decay rate. So um, this quantity is really a decay rate because it just tells you some probability per unit time. Okay. So, and these, this is all standard physics, and so the only difference here is that we're interpreting decay rates which describe 
the rate at which um, an excited object will decay or the rate at which a ground state or lower state object will be excited, that, that actually they describe the probability that you're going to get the non-unitary transition. Because in this theory, that's the only way you get any photon to happen, you know, that's the, way, the only way you get a real radiative process is because the non-unitary transition occurred. Okay, so, so this is the probability, this all probability that we're gonna get this real photon emitted and absorbed is also the probability for non-unitary transition. Non-unitary. And, and it happens at the microscopic level, so that's the key. Okay, so this is what isn't, you know, it, it sounds like maybe a strong, oh, you need to push this up? Okay. Is that better? Okay. So, um, this, is, this is what's sort of missing in standard theory. It's sort of right in front of you, but you can't, you don't interpret it that way, because at this point you're, you're just applying a, a Born rule because you were told to, because Born fought in a footnote, you realize that you needed to square the wave function to get the probability rather than just the probability, <laughs> the wave function itself. You know, complete, complete mystery. It's totally ad hoc and it works. You know, why does it work? The direct action theory, I think, seems to tell us why it works because if you, you know, if you look at it in the sense that you're only getting a real photon when both these processes occur. And how nice that the processes, the amplitudes, are, are already complex conjugates of each other. And you, you just multiply them together, then you get the Born rule. So, so I mean, this, this, this approach tells you why anytime there's a situation in which the probabilities tell you that it's overwhelmingly likely, the probability, the decay rates tell you it's overwhelmingly likely that in my lab, in this apparatus, when that laser got turned on, that when my watch tells me, you know, five seconds have gone by, I've had, you know, X photons emitted and detected. The, the physics is telling you that that was the probability that you had measurement transitions which each, with each of those. So the physics is already telling you, yes, the non-unitary transition occurred because you got, you know, your, your probabilities, it's overwhelmingly likely that by the time you went back and looked at your detector, those little spots you saw are real, you know? They're really there, and they're really on, you know, the tip of the iceberg, okay? So, so this is the probability that, back to our like, little iceberg picture, okay, that there were processes going on here between the, the emitter, you know, and the absorber, and they were virtually in, in direct contact, in a sense, with this non-local direct action, and at some point, as, as governed by the probabilistic decay rates, a photon got emitted, bam, a measurement occurred, and there's really something up there in space and time, and that's why you see it. Okay, so I like it. I mean, it's, you know, what's not to like? I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe what's not to like is uh, that the, the direct action theory has got this non-local aspect to it. Yes? So there's only ever one Photons, but no luminal photons? Oh, no, no, no. I mean, what would be down here would be the, what I'm calling the virtual photons. So all of this here, you've got, you've got found electrons. Uh, you've got what I call, uh, you know, in the direct action theory, it's the direct connection. So there's a field there, whatever you want to call it, the field correlation. That's real. It's physically real. It's just... It's just not going to be something that will trigger the measurement transition so it's at the level of possibility. So you've got all the things that go on scattering, things that are described by the unitary processes. You know, all the quantum unitary processes are, are still real, but they're not, uh, you know, they don't result in phenomena directly. To, to rephrase, uh, do real phenomena exist as waves or as particles? In this picture, the, the ontology is that of waves. So, so yeah, I mean, again, that's something that perhaps is not obligatory, but I think that's the most natural way to understand it. I know that when Feynman formulated um, his, his sum over paths, he had a particle picture in mind, and he had a, a, you know, the idea of a particle exploring all possible paths. 
But the way in which these these paths have to add, and they're adding, they're interfering really in a wave-like way. And so that's why I think that we're looking at a wave-like behavior at an ontological level. So that the, where the, you know, if you want to talk about wave-particle duality, where you get the particle-like phenomena is where you have, um, say, different, say you're in your lab and you've, you've got a detector, several detectors. So you say you're doing a Stern-Gerlach experiment or something, and you've got, you've got a system, you know, and you've got detector A and detector B. Um, well, at some point when you get this measurement transition, which is governed by these kinds of probabilities, so you can, you can know based on the materials you're working with and the energies you're working with, in what period of time you can expect to get these phenomena, get the measurement transition to occur. And so that's why, you know, when we're dealing with lasers and very large detectors, which have a large number of absorbers in them, we're virtually assured that the, the, the rates are such that, it's, you know, within a few minutes we're going to get stuff, that, because that's what the probabilities would tell us. So then what, what do we get? We get, you know, these little localized phenomena. Well, the, those are the particle-like phenomena, but the, they're, you know, I, my preference is, is the idea that the ontology is really waves, and that the particle-like phenomena occur from the discreteness, the fact that you've only got, say, a field that has, you know, um, one, you know, you've got field excitations that go in, in units of number of photons that the field can have. Well, well suppose you've just got one uh, excitation that can only deliver one photon. Well, you've got two basic, you know, macro absorbers here that are responding, and they are contributing in the sense of they're, they're contributing to cancel out the, the advanced fields from the emitter and so on. So they definitely contribute to this whole process. However, only one of them can win. This is the collapse, or this is that second stage, which I, I view as symmetry breaking. And when it does, only one of these, well, it's basically a, a single molecule or whatever excitable bound state is the one that wins that competition, is the one that will change its chemical nature to result in a phenomenon that could eventually be amplified to the point where you can see it, which is kind of what, ta what takes place in photographic film. You know, that's why we see an image. There, there's a latent image in, in, in photographic film at the microscopic level, and it's at that point where we know a photon has been absorbed, even if, you know, you, you don't have to talk about what is observation, you know, what, what, how do I define measurement in terms of what I can observe? You don't have to ask those kinds of questions. All you have to do is say, when these probabilities dictate that it's overwhelmingly likely that this tr dis transition described by the probability has occurred, then it has occurred and, and you know, usually you can spot some consequence of it. But even if you can't, you can know that, that you know, the physics isn't lying to you and that what we call a measurement has happened. So um, I think another way to think about this whole measurement thing that has gotten so mystified um, is to think about, I mean, this is the way I like to think of it. So what measurement, okay, um, the idea of how do observers play into measurement, the term measurement, okay, so, um, well, we know that when we're around and we're in a lab and we're doing observations, you know, we, we can say that we're doing measurements, okay? So we can say that um, observers, we as observers, are sufficient. We're sufficient to say that measurement is occurring. Sufficient for measurement. But the important thing is not necessary. It's just not, not we're not that important. But we're just not really necessary. And I think that this little simple logical point has been very confusing because it, it is absolutely true that, you know, when you're walking around and you've got, you know, sense organs, which are basically absorbers and, and emitters, but functioning as absorbers, then clearly, you know, there's light and clearly I'm, you know, if I'm an absorber, then I'm getting a photon here and there and I'm lots of photons, and that enables me to construct a, you know, an image of phenomenal reality, and sure, I'm, I'm, I'm participating in measurements, but I'm not necessary. It's not, not that important. Okay, so it's sort of like if you think of, 
now think of a, a rough analogy. So, so eating, all right, that's a different action, okay? Eating, eating happens when uh, humans are at dinner, you know, humans at dinner. Okay, so that's definitely a sufficient condition for humans, you know, for, for eating to be taking place, taking place, sufficient. But, you know, look at a Venn diagram, okay, so, it's too small, but, um, so this is our eating Venn diagram, okay, so, um, humans eating dinner, but, you know, there's also uh, an amoeba eat, dining on a bacterium, consuming bacterium, is con constitutes eating. Okay, so simple logical point. So the same thing applies to measurement. You know, basically the same the same circle. Humans in the lab, or anywhere. You know, we're doing we're we're participating in measurement. But atom absorbing photon. The real energy of the photon, you know, like winning the transaction, or whatever. Actually, even just generating a confirmation, but not being the one that receives the photon, that constitutes as measurement. So the term measurement, you know, it has these anthropomorphic connotations that make it all confusing. But really, what we all we mean is non-unitary transition. It is going on when we are around measuring things. It's also going on when those conditions are satisfied between microscopic objects. So, so that's the basic idea. Um, I, I mean, and, and I think, I think, I hope if, if I'm not mistaken, this allows us to answer the, the concern about, okay, well, you know, you're talking about absorbers, and absorbers do this, and when they do that, that's measurement. And a lot of people are very skeptical, and they say, well, they, they expect an infinite regress, because that's what we get everywhere else in quantum. You know, they're so used to, you know, it can't, there can't really be a solution to the measurement problem. There's got to be something wrong with this. And I understand that, but, but, but in fact, it is quantifiable that it's, it's quantifiable according to standard physics, and all we have to do is is have a model in which, um, in order to have a real photon existing at all, we must have both the emission and the absorption, that they're both crucial components of the creation of the real photon, that they're, they're part of. And then the, in the math, I mean, the mathematics of that is, is presented very nicely by Davies. I can, I can get a little bit more into those technical details later if people want to see that, um, you know, in more detail, how the absorber response constitutes this free field that plays the role of, in the classical real and finding theory, of that free field that's responsible for the loss of energy, that's nothing other than the real photon that is created that goes from the emitter to the absorber. So, so that's sort of the, um, the quantitative aspect of how we get a measurement transition. Does anyone want to have any more concerns or? Yeah. So in quantum optics experiments, people like send photons and they say that they use photons to encode quantum information or whatever. But these you will not say that they're real photons. Because oh. can, they, they involve in the I mean Oh no, I mean you can I can have this situation and you can do any kinds of experiments you want. Um, I mean, there are many uh, interesting optics experiments that involve coherent states and, and you know, interesting states of the, of the field. Um, and, and you can create any state of the field you want, but still have the direct action theory apply. I mean, so it is empirically equivalent. I mean, so it, the idea is, that, you know, you're going to have an emitter somewhere, so you're going to have like, like a laser or something, whatever, and then you can have whatever kinds of systems you want. They can they can involve, um, you know, uncertainty and scattering, which would be unitary. So you can have interactions in which you can have scattering. Uh, the photon might go several possible ways, put it in a superposition of paths, and, and that's certainly part part of it. So I mean, it's whether or not you're going to get uh, a transition that uh, non-unitary transition is simply described by these probabilities. So if you had 
if you had objects in your experiment, suppose you wanted to create an interesting, a coherent state or, or something in which the photon was, was um, you're going to see interference effects and things that are available only from unitarity. Well, you certainly can do that, and the way you do it is by making sure that the materials are just kind of materials in this box, okay, whatever materials are using in your experiment are such that the probability that one of them is going to generate a confirmation is very low. And everybody, that's basically what you do in the lab when you, when you preserve the non-unitary behavior at any stage of your experiment, you're simply working with the kinds of materials that, that are not going to, you know, trigger this, this collapse. I mean, like these amplitudes you can calculate, but any, any state has a well-defined amplitude with any other state. And to say when it collapses, you need to like, solve the measurement problem. So, I mean, it's yeah, and, and, and the measurement, well, I mean... You could have taken another state, it would not have, but, like, you can calculate any overlap, right? And, and it only collapses in one basis, for example. Well, I mean, you can take any system you want, and based on the applicable transitions, you can find out whether the, the particular system you're looking at is going to trigger that transition or not. You know, within some reasonable time frame. And how, how do you do it? Well, I mean, the, these kinds of amplitudes, I mean, you can have an amplitude for, to transition between two states that's very rare, a very rare one, okay? So if you want to foil collapse, in an experiment, if you want to sustain unitarity, then you need to work with such that, you know, Fermi's golden rule, for whatever materials you're working with, gives you a really tiny decay rate. You, you know, we can do that, right? I mean, a lot of materials are just not gonna decay for a long time, or not gonna absorb for a long time. And I think that when you work with these materials in the lab, I mean, anyone, it, it's common sense, really. If I want to, um, make this photon in an interesting superposition such that unitarity is preserved in some part of its uh, process before some final detection screen. Then I sure don't want to put a de detection screen there, you know, and that's what the putting a detection screen here, which would give us a which way measurement, is precisely because the materials in that are going to have a high transition probability so that within, you know, a minute, Bing, you've, you've foiled, you've screwed up your interference pattern because you put something in, you know, accessible to the photon such that you were going to get collapsed there. That's why you get a which way measurement instead of an, a both ways measurement. But it's not by using this, I mean, you can, let's say you flip the polarization of the photon using a wave plate. Mm -hmm. This amplitude is equal to one. That's the, that's the point of the interaction is to completely set one state with the problem state. But it's not a measurement, it's just a unit. So you cannot like, blindly use this rule and it's, you need. Right? Well, and not blindly using the rule. Um, if you want, are you saying you would like to affect a unitary polarization flip? Yeah. I mean, you, you can do I mean, that. <laughs> There's nothing about calculating this that precludes using materials that will unitarily rotate the polarization. But, that, but you would not do that by putting a hunk of absorbing stuff here. I mean, you would have a force field. You would have you know, a magnetic field, a stern gerlach apparatus, whatever, that, that's, that's not made of a bunch of absorbing materials, right? So I mean, you do whatever you want, uh, and you can do whatever unitary transitions you want. Now, no physicist would say, well, let's see, I'm going to take an experiment, and I would like to put a photon in, and I would like to unitarily change its spin of polarization, you know. Great. Well, well no physicist is going to say, but I better calculate this. Well, you know, I didn't put any absorber here, so there's not, that probability would not apply to anything in this part of the experiment. It, it's only when you're t looking at particular systems that can emit, okay, this has some probability of emitting, but it, where it's going to end up is governed by whatever materials you're using, and they are the ones, the, whatever kinds of transitions can happen in that material, that's what you're going to be calculating the probability of. So, I mean, it's, it's not like I'm saying you should do this, app, do this calculation when it doesn't apply to 
this part of your, no, of course you can have not, you can have unitary processes. It's just that when you're looking at where did my detection happen, what am I going to do when I want to detect a result, a final result that I can write down, those are always happening because something like this, this decay rate happened because the, a photon was emitted here and then detected at your final spot. That, and that's what the probability applies to. And it, you know, this is just a very simple example that only deals with the, uh, you know, a simple emitter and an available absorber somewhere in its vicinity and, and where there is no intervening forces or other things. That's certainly, if you want to think about those kinds of situations, that involves much more complicated calculation. And so I would like to know, uh, this sort of uh, absorption is in a sense absolute, but that is a wrong way to describe this unitary from somebody who would be able to uh, trace all degrees of freedom. I'm, I'm going towards kind of being a friend situation, so I would like to know what, what is your take on it. Yeah, that's sort of what Schrodinger called the damn quantum jumps, you know, and, and what they are, I mean, when you have a Fox state, okay, so it's well known, you know, the Fox state is basically an excited state of the field with, say, for simplicity, one photon with momentum k. Well, it's notorious that, that if you have a situation where you know you've got one photon, you manage to detect it later, absorb it, you also, unfortunately, cannot say anything about when it was emitted or when it was absorbed in its proportion to its energy. But it, it's, it's an uncertainty relation, and it's part of standard quantum mechanics. So, so there's actually an uncertainty relation that accompanies particle number, uh, particle number and phase is actually governed by an uncertainty relation where, where phase is related to time. You can tag, you can tag the behavior of, of the process or the wave or whatever to a time index. And that quantum mechanics <coughs> simply tells us that the generation of these states with well-defined um, photon number, quantum number, are completely unpredictable. They have no defined phase. And so that is, again, it's part of the uncertainty principle. When we have a wave, like a, a classical EM wave, with very well-defined phase, we only get that because we're working with a quantum state of maximal uncertainty as to how many photons there are in it. Those are the coherent states. And the so-called coherent states, uh, there's no fact of the matter about photon numbers. So what these actually deal with is situations where atoms are um, in within this time uncertainty of their decay process. If you sort of map it, if you sort of say, okay, well, you know, uh, uh, here's time um, and the probability that at some time there's a decay rate fairly constant. And according to Fermi's golden rule, that um, when you're in, in you're in a time zone that's, or maybe it's ex exponential. I'm not sure. I should know that. But at some characteristic time, let's say a half-life, um, say tau, so you're dealing with with a real atom here. I'm, I'm, you know, here's an excited atom E. Okay, excited atom, whatever. And uh, this this electron also has an absorber, or at least one absorber, and that's why. You know, it, it can even think about decay. Well, there's this period of uncertainty where there is no fact of the matter about whether this thing has decayed. And these are actually ways to store coherent states. Because you've got an a, a atom that's actually sort of in a, in a superposition of having excited, excited and unexcited. Because it's, it's within this uncertainty range of at a particular time, tau, if, if there's like half, I suppose the probability is half then it's in, it's really in a superposition, and, and that's all we know, you know, so, so that's the sense in which when we're in this uh, time constant period where there's really very clear uncertainty about whether a given atom has decayed or not, or a given atom has absorbed or not, they really are in these, these superpositions, and that's how people create these, these interesting optics, optics experiments where they're actually storing these kind of states that, again, the field has no definite number of photons in it. And it's when we're in the zone of, you know, no clear fact of the matter 
about whether decay, whether emission has occurred or not, that we get these more exotic states. That, but, but again, it's, you can predict it so that you can say, well, by the time I've gotten to here, you know, where the probability is almost one, you know, call, call this tau f, then I can be pretty sure that, that the thing has decayed. Then, but that's the only sense, you know, we can't, we can never say, oh, I know it's going to decay now. You know, we just can't, that's part of the uncertainty relation. And uh, after this tau f, it's decayed, but everybody has no way to recohere the thing. It's just absolutely decayed. Well, um, when, when you have a phenomenon such as, when you can detect that an absorbing atom is in an excited state, you know, when it, there are ways of seeing whether one of your absorbers is excited or not, then you can trust that, and especially when your, um, your process occurred in such a time that, that its probability of, of decaying was overwhelming. That's what the physics tells you. Then, then yes, and you have evident, company evidence that another system became excited, then those are measurement processes. That yes, with probability one, the measurement transition occurred within this time scale. So if I may now even be more specific, yeah. so when I go to the bigger friend situation, would you suggest through this uh, interpretation that the state of the friend is inside and performs the measurements at the end collapses, in which other sense collapses, and it's not possible to recohere. here. Well, yeah, I mean, I would say, according to this analysis, if you have uh, some kind of unstable atom in your Geiger counter, if you simply apply physics to it, then you will get decay rates for, in what period of time will, will this decay? Well, yeah, so, so you have, and this is sort of like, well, within one hour, okay? But the other issue is, that the other issue is that when you have a macroscopic system, this is something I've dealt with in another paper, the more absorbers you have, the more uh, likely it is that decay has occurred somewhere because you're basically, um, let me just just kind of lay this out as clearly as I can. So, so in, when you've got like the cat, the cat in the box, okay, so you've got, and you've got a Geiger counter, let's say you've got this Geiger counter, it's composed of a large number of absorbing atoms. Okay, so for, for only one, if you were only dealing with one absorbing atom, you would have this nominal transition rate. But once you've got a lot of them, that actually raises the probability enormously that within a short, much shorter time, you're going to have at least one of these guys confirm and you're going to get your measurement transition. So how that works is, Suppose we go back to, let me see, I'll, I'll just erase this stuff. Mm -hmm. Is there an eraser? So, if we go back to our basic little, little interaction and think of these things are bound, perhaps, these are, these are bound currents. So this is, say, an excited electron, we'll call it E, and call this a ground state electron. Well, once again, the, the basic probability that we're going to get an offer and a confirmation and a non unitary transition is given by the fine structure constant, which is basically the um, square of the electromagnetic charge. And it turns out to be about 1 over 137. So this is a pretty small number. It's about 0 0.007, something like that. So if you've only got one of these, which you've got one unstable atom and only one absorbing atom, then the possibility, and this, this doesn't involve the transition rates and, and the time dependence, but because I haven't put in the transition probabilities. But this is your basic coupling probability that um, that Feynman called the basic probability to emit or absorb a real photon. So this is kind of a, you know, a, a, a lower bound on how likely, or maybe an upper bound on how probable these processes are. But we'll just use it as a very rough approximation. So suppose the probability was that within an hour, um, there was this chance that it, that it was going to generate the measurement transition. Well, that's very small. Okay. But the minute you start having larger systems, larger absorbing systems, so 
we um, we can look now at that that changes. So we can look now at the, the probability. Let's look at the complement. So the probability that no confirming response, no absorption happens is going to be one minus this. You know, this is just the complement. So the the complement that this is the complement possibility that we do get the transition. This is the probability that we don't. So it's the complement of it. So it turns out to be uh, about 0.993, pretty pretty darn high. So it's very likely that nothing's going to happen in that situation. It's going to remain unitary. There's going to continue to be superpositions and so on. So, um, but that suppose we have something that counts as a detector. Um, let me see. Okay. So it's the probability that we've got now n of these absorbing systems, probability that in n of them, there will be no conserve confirming response, is going to be the same thing, the same number to the n. Okay, so I'm just, just independent probability. So, so as I increase my detection apparatus, such that it's made of a bunch of atoms that could potentially absorb, the probability that none of them will absorb is, is uh, this large number to the n. But this is going to get smaller as n increases. So it turns out that when you start having macroscopic objects, like a Geiger counter, which is designed to be a detector, it's designed to absorb stuff, then some n is getting to be you know, really, really large. I'm just plugged in some numbers here. Like, like, say, 10 to the 23 absorbing systems in it. And when you when you get that, the probability basically goes to zero. So what that means is, with that many systems in it, the probability that it will not trigger the measurement transition is zero. So basically that means that the probability that it will is one, okay? So that's kind of an argument why um, when you're dealing with, you know, a system like this, the Schrodinger cat experiment, um, even if you've got nominally, you know, a, an unstable atom whose half-life is, you know, an hour or half an hour or whatever, um, it, that only is for, I mean, they may, they may do it for um, a, an absorbing shell. I'm not sure how, how they do that calculation, but um, I think that if you take into account the macroscopic objects here, than the macroscopic absorbing objects, then within a certain time, rather than just being the probability being very small that, that there will be a measurement transition, the probability that there will be confirmations by at least one of those is, is approaching unity. So that's why in this picture, it's overwhelmingly likely that you're gonna get collapse at some point so in, in the box. Real. Geiger counters do have 10 to the 23, and real atoms have half lives. Okay. So uh, this is cannot be true. Uh, I mean, in reality, this can be measured. It is not zero. Or, or mm -hmm. Okay. Well, and if even if we want to quibble and say, okay, this particular analysis, you know, wouldn't apply to the the level of the emitting atom or the unstable atom. The fact is that you could still have a fact of the matter, suppose the, um, the atom itself is in, that, uh, is in that superposition, so you can have it, you know, uh, the atom would still be um, excited plus decay. Okay, so there's still a time um, dependence to this, but nevertheless, just as before, even though there's there's a high uncertainty as to the time period, so it's got a very slow time constant. But nevertheless, what the direct action theory gives you is that there is a fact of the matter when this thing does decay. So, so it's not the case that, I mean, like anything else in the box or the Geiger counter could when, it, when there's a confirmation, that's described not by an amplitude, but by a probability. So that's the difference here. I mean, you've got, um, you've got the atom in a superposition, but the, the claim is that the superposition is confined to the atom, because when you've got, in order to have that real, whatever it is, decay product, 
you must have a confirmation. And, and the, the existence of a confirmation always comes with the corresponding offer. There's a mutuality there. And that is described by a probability, not an amplitude. So, so there's a well-defined probability here, once again, at the applicable decay rate, which may be a long one. But because there's a probability, I mean, in the standard unitary only approach, the, the amplitude of decay is described only by, it's described only by an amplitude, because it's unitary. The difference here is that it has a well-defined probability. So just, just as in this same picture, but, um, you've got, say, this, this picture, and you've got the unstable atom here. And then you've got potential absorbers. There's a well-defined probability for this offer confirmation to occur. And that's the difference, is that, that you've got um, the square of something. I just symbolize it with that. There's an actual square of these factors, the, the transition amplitudes, and alpha. So you've got, you know, your transition amplitude, initial, final, the, the perturbation that's causing the instability. So you've got a probability here. So even though for a long, there's a long time constant and there's a lot of uncertainty about when it will decay, there's an actual well-defined probability that, that there's a non-unitary transition. And so the difference, the, the choices are, um, for some period of time, which you can't predict, up to time t, um, it's, in an, uh, it's in the superposition. So it's in the excited plus unexcited state. There's a well-defined probability that, it, that after that, it will be, have decayed. You just, there's uncertainty, but it's a probabilistic uncertainty. It's not an amplitude, it's not a unitary process. So I hope that, I hope that clarifies the, the difference as to why we can say that at some point, at the level of the decaying atom, it has a real probability of decay, and the probability doesn't just come from an ad hoc squaring of the Bohr rule. It doesn't just come from, well, I don't know where the cut is, but I'm just gonna square it. It's an actual physical process that forces us to square this process because there are real absorbers whose, re whose participation is required in order to have that happen. So it's a probability rather than an amplitude, and that's why it's, there's a determinant matter, matter of fact. Yeah. Uh, you said that this uh, offer of confirmation that occurs so I, I really wonder, is it a mathematical concept, just to clarify the mathematics behind this, or is this a, any kind of physical idea of the current? If yes, then what do you mean by it occurs? Um, I do mean that a field is generated. So I mean that a physical process is, is generated that is um, this response of the absorber coming back to... Um, back up at the top here. Let's see. Okay, let me get that. Okay, so this picture, in, you know, if, if you had it in a kind of a backwards order, the, the picture B is the basic, oh, come back. Okay. This is the basic time symmetric connection between fields. Um, but this, the, this only exists if there is absorber response. So it's a physical field, and when it occurs, and that's a probabilistic, it's a probabilistic situation as to when it occurs, so it's uncertain, but described by, by a well-defined probability, basically the Fermi's golden rule. And when that field exists, we get this physical process of cancellation of the advanced fields and cancellation of retarded fields beyond the absorber, so we get the real, the real full energy field that is the real photon. Without the absorber response, we don't have this, and we only have this time symmetric field, and that's what I think of as a virtual photon. No real energy is transferred, it remains unitary. Okay. But, but no 
was nothing like what we have in classical physics where we have this uh, some kind of, of response, things like in resonance phenomena and something that is nothing concerned with, with the time delay, energy and all these issues happens. Because here is some, some kind of communication between two systems mm -hmm. and in, 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 at least in classical ideas you have some some uh, uh, some time delay and so on, some 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 energy issues. Yeah, so it's all not. These it's is, very uh, non-classical. Well, it's very non-classical in the sense yeah, that the, these yeah. processes are not really um, taking place in a space time in a way that can be tagged to but a time why index. Think of process? Just okay, from so a mathematical point of view. Right. So that gets to questions of how are we to understand um, uh, what the claim that. There can be real physical processes, I hope I can find this, um, that are not amenable to a space-time description that can't really be thought of as occurring in space-time. Um, and, and actually, you know, so, so this is sort of like, okay, with your classical fields, you have everything indexed to space and time in a causal way. With, with what I, you know, my proposal is that quantum theory is describing sub-empirical processes and, and we all know, you know, quantum theory has non-locality and, and so on. We, it always has, already has these features that, that challenge those classical ideas of cause and effect and, and, the, idea, and, the, and the strictures of relativity. So this is one of them that, that does these kinds of um, field interactions that I claim are physically real, but that are precursors, because they're precursors to space-time events, they themselves cannot be tied to time indices in the usual way. They can be tied to time indices if you're in the Heisenberg picture of operators and so on, then I haven't gotten to that, but, um, but it is possible to at a certain level. But, but certainly, you know, with the question of how am I gonna explain why and when and how, uh, or at least why and when, there is a response, a physical response, that's indeterministic. It's fundamental. It's a brute, you know, indeterminist. So you give up space time, but you preserve mathematics. So it's kind of absolutely. I see it's a kind of priority of mathematics over. Well, I don't see it that way. I see it as, um, you know, Heisenberg was 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 forced to just kind of give up mo classical model making, and that when he did that, he came up with this mathematics that described the empirical phenomena that he was seeing, even though he didn't even he didn't know what a matrix was. But what he, you know, the brilliance, in my opinion, you know, my view, is that he said, okay, I'm not having any success in making a picture of what's going on. I don't see, I can't visualize what's going on. But if I just look at energy levels, discrete energy levels, and the, and the way they relate to each other, I get these laundry lists, which he called them. That was the math. That was the theory. Nature, I see, what I see is that nature gave us the theory through Heisenberg, who was able to kind of have a beginner's mind and just go, okay, I don't know what's going on, but here's the math that seems to describe the phenomena. So, so you know, rather than prioritize math, because certainly we can come up with any old crazy mathematical theory we want that has nothing to do with anything, right? But quantum theory, in my view, was, was a theory that is a mathematical construct that worked. And that's why I'm motivated to say, well, maybe it's describing a structure that's real, even though it doesn't, can't be a space-time structure. So that's kind of the idea. This gentleman's but in this yeah. speculation, like we say that it's a structure and it's real, but there's no possible way we can ever measure it. So I would not say that the structure is real, but it is like a concept to explain uh, things that happen in reality, but it still has this, but it still has this weak point, like it cannot explain uh, which of this uh, Possible uh, states are realized. Uh, so it is well, see, is that really a weakness? I mean, you know, well, we could have the same concern about the Higgs mechanism. If you're not, if you're not happy yes. with the idea of yes. spontaneous symmetry yes. breaking, then that would be a reason to reject the Higgs mechanism. Yes, you know? maybe not, not reject it, but say that it's not a complete theory and it has to be refined or something like that. Um, yes. But okay, I yeah. I don't, um, don't understand how this is better than the Copenhagen interpretation, except that it explains the, the Born rule. I think this is the only thing that 
the disk better because that it has it explains the one group, but I think the, the rest is not more realistic or anything. Uh, well, you know, again, that goes to, and I, I thank you for saying that it explains the Bourne rule, because if that's all it did, that would be great. I, I'm happy with that. Um, I, I understand your concern about, you know, am I building a little castle in the air here, you know, um, and I don't ever want to do things like that. However, I, I think that, you know, it's a reasonable idea to suppose that if a different theory of the way fields work can explain what is, I think, kind of an anomaly of the original theory where it's just, oh, there's this born rule that, God, it works and I don't know why and I don't know at what, what point we should apply it. If you have a theory of fields that then answers those questions um, and then it, it's, and also provides reference for, for quantities in the theory that, you know, such as the advanced states, the dual states, that, that are just mathematical machinery, if it, it seems to be, I mean, it's kind of an inference to the best explanation argument that, that there are things about the theory that we don't understand. Why does it work so well? Why does it have these strange non-local features? Why do you have to use the Born rule? What, at p what point is there a measurement? If you have a, a different picture of the way fields behave that can answer all these questions and to me seems like a fairly consistent and natural way, then that would be kind of an inference to the best explanation. And it's not observer dependent. I mean, Copenhagen is very much, um, I have, well, I have a, p a paper um, called Beyond Complementarity that, that is a fairly sustained critique of Bohr's statements. And I, and I argue that he actually really said a lot of inconsistent things. And I don't, I don't think that, that that picture really holds together in a kind of fundamental way. I mean, in contrast, that this is a statement about the way fields behave. It's hard to visualize, but, um, you know, it, it's sort of like if you think about, how many of you have read the book Flatland? It's a little parable about, you know, uh, uh, pe shapes that live in a flat world, and from there, their, all of their experience is, is two-dimensional. And so, at some point, uh, this one guy who's a square, who's an upstanding, you know, well-behaved citizen, is visited by a sphere, you know, this guy who lives in higher, in higher dimensional realm. And the sphere gets a lot of flack from the square for lying and trying to put something over on him and trying to trick him because he's doing all these crazy non-local things. And um, it, it, I think it's a good analogy because the square, you know, is used to certain kinds of explanations. And the sphere can do things that challenge those forms of explanation and don't make any sense. And so eventually, you know, the, the sphere actually resorts to kicking the square out of flatland and the square's forced to get out, oh my god, there's more to reality than I could ever perceive or suspect. And of course, then he comes back and then they put him in jail as a heresy. And then, and then at some point, the sphere goes to a hypersphere. There's a key point in the story where the sphere goes to a four-dimensional sphere and says, or no, oh, I'm sorry, you got that wrong, no. Okay, so instead, the, the sphere is challenged by the square's grandson. The grandson says, hey, if there can be beings like you, like you, then that means there could also be four-dimensional beings that would be larger than what you can experience. And of course, the sphere got very upset and very indignant about that. That's a stupid idea, you know. So, I mean, the, the moral, I guess, you know, I could be completely wrong, and this might be completely delusional, but I think that it, an interesting way to explore quantum theory realistically it is to say, is it just simply referring to stuff that, that is precursor to space-time? You know, does space-time have to be the whole story? And I'm not, I'm not the only one with this, you know, possible delusion. Uh, um, Anton Zeilinger has recently, I don't know if I have the quote in front of me, but he recently proposed that we should perhaps um, subject our, the, the concept of space and time to the same kind of critical evaluation that we have other concepts that we may have had to let go of. So, you know, it's something to think about, that, that there may be processes that, that are very real, and by process, I mean, there was always Whitehead, right? I mean, Whitehead is very hard to read, but um, Alfred North Whitehead, who long ago was talking about process philosophy and the idea that, um, that, that reality is more than just 
isolating phenomena, that there are these processes. Now, I depart from his account in, in, in the sense that I don't bring in experience and consciousness as a fundamental ingredient of these processes. So my approach could be seen as kind of radical in the sense that I'm saying, I think quantum theory is pointing to real physics, real physical processes that are simply uh, outside the space-time construct. But I'm more conservative and stodgy and viewed as a real reactionary by the people who are claiming that, that quantum theory tells us that consciousness is vital and that you need consciousness. And the reason I reject that is because invoking consciousness as a means of defining measurement doesn't work. It doesn't work. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's neither necessary nor sufficient. Because the Wigner's friend argument already, Wigner, I'm sorry, I don't know pronunciation. Wigner's friend argument already tells us that, you know, you can never, there's just an uh, infinite regress what counts as your external conscious observer. You know, it's arbitrary. It's, 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 it's arbitrary, and there, you can never say at what point measurement has occurred. I think with this account, you can give a physical account that has well-defined probabilities that measurement has occurred. It still seem, maybe feels deficient to some of us who feel like, um, you know, th there should be a, a, a uh, very clear causal account that can be tagged to a time index and so on. But that, I would suggest, is the nature of, of the quantum reality, is that it is fundamentally indeterministic. And, and this is why I think Heisenberg wanted to refer to it as this realm of possibility that, that is sort of in between, you know, maybe just an idea that we might have. It's in between just an you know, abstract idea and the concrete space-time phenomena that we can all corroborate. You know, I mean, to make that distinction more clear, um, you know, it's, it's not idealistic in the sense that I don't want to claim that all ideas are real. You know, I don't want to claim that there, there was a criticism of this idea by Quine who, who critiqued the idea of that possible fat man in the doorway, you know. That's like not everything you, you just randomly cook up has, has some physical reality or physical significance. But I think quantum theory is specifically a theory of those objects that do have physical reality, but just not space-time phenomenal reality. So. Uh, from what I understand, uh, the difference between uh, realism and idealism is idealism uh, says something like that the reality is created by ideas, and realism says that the ideas are a product of reality because the uh, where the human brain uh, exists in reality and because of some evolutionary processes it develops to a stage where it got these ideas. Um, yes, so, and from this part of view I don't think that it's more realistic than the Copenhagen interpretation because the unobserved uh, parts are like the unobservable uh, wave function in the Copenhagen interpretation, so, um, yes. Well, um, yeah, he, you know, Bohr was, was interesting about that, you know, he, he called the wave function, um, you know, unobservable and abstract, and, and yet he would say things like, it is only when it interacts with, um, a, with concrete things that it becomes, you know, and, and that doesn't explain what the interaction is. So, I mean, I think a lot of it, it was hand-waving. I mean, so, I, yeah, I don't want to be compared to the Copenhagen interpretation. You're entitled to have whatever view you want. But I, I think he was kind of in denial about, I think he was very anti-realist about, in other words, what he did was he, he, he implicitly required that real means tip of the iceberg, that real means classical. That was, I don't think he ever came out and said that. But when you look at what he says, he. He implicitly kind of re required that, and so so when he talked about the wave function, he he really when he said abstract, he meant that it was not physically real. Now what I'm saying in contrast is the stuff going on under un, in the iceberg is just as real as what the Titanic ran into. I mean, uh, physically real, although they couldn't see it. But we run into quantum theory. I mean, we can't get away from it. We physically run into quantum systems, and that's why we had to develop quantum theory. And, and if they weren't physically real, then 
we didn't need to ever pay any, we would never would have had quantum well, theory. But we could develop a completely different theory which uh, leads to the same physical results. So, uh, yes. Yeah, I, well, we would have had to have some theory that accounted for for the phenomena that, that, that are observed from quantum systems. And, and so I argue that though, that suggests those quantum systems are real, whether we like it or not. You know, they're real. And, and I think they're real, and I, I just suggest we need to expand our notion of what real means. That real means more than just the space-time level. Yeah. Um, we just drifted from the lecture to the discussion, so I wanted to ask you okay. if we have another break before we'll Oh, sure, we, yes, yeah. Uh, I was just kind of, if you would like, we can just continue it's, it's as we to, It's up to you guys. It's Who cooler in here. Break? People aren't fainting anymore, so I'm happy okay. to... Yeah. Uh, I'm happy to chat. So yeah, I'm looking at any questions for you. If you are not fine, we can continue to a few questions or I don't know. It's, it's up to you. I, you know, if anyone is really just feeling like they're completely confused and unhappy, then I would love to try to deal with that. You know, so you won't go away now. It's still a Dina with you and, and, and students can join them for Dina later on. But okay. there are a few questions more. So we should ask you next question. Okay. Oh, I think the gentleman no, back there. No, those were oh, they were okay. Thank you for keeping track. Yeah. Just yeah. just wanted to clarify what you mean by process. Um. Well, the objects. I mean, to tie them to mathematical quantities, this time symmetric propagator, I view it as a process. I view it as something that is physically going on among systems. So I view, you know, and these are really field correlations. They are a kind of field correlation. Uh, so in that sense, I, you know, I'm going to be agnostic about. I don't claim, I don't presume to tell you. Well, the fields are made of this, and there are substances. That, you know, Democritus or so, I don't know. You know, I'm more of a structural realist. So, but I'm, what I'm saying is that I, th I think these entities are real. I can't visualize them. I can't tell you what they're made of. Uh, I can characterize them a as as possibilities in the sense of Heisenberg. And I think there's a dynamic dynamicity to them. But, but, but then for, for, for any kind of dynamics or processing things under the way is maybe we should uh, you need still time. So how do you how do you okay. time? Yeah I would I would say that I, I wouldn't assent to the idea that, that dynamicism means a space time index. So you know you can have I think you can have um, dynamical things going on but but this requires an expanded um, meaning or interpretation of what we mean by dynamic because, because actually I mean to sort of go look at it the other way there are many people who believe um, in either a block world or in, in a deterministic system now in, in such a system you and that's it okay so we have space time and suppose we think space time is unfolding in a deterministic manner which say the hidden variables like Bohmian you know would think that that, that isn't, you know, people have argued, there, there's a philosopher named Milik Kapek who, who had, had a very sustained argument that, and I can provide you a reference, that those kinds of processes are just, they're pseudo-dynamic because they're inevitable. There's no, they're, they're just sort of, uh, it's like unrolling a, a roll of events that's already been decided and, and the time index just indexes how far you've unrolled it. And, and it, you know, one can make a case that, that that's only sort of an apparent dynamics, that, that it's just kind of, well, there's no real change. In other words, it's nothing that's really changing. It's just inevitable. There's, there's just some set of events that was already preordained from the beginning. And whether we have a block world in which it's all just there and it's static, or we unroll it and let it become, but it's all pre-decided, pre then we can call that dynamic, but it, it's just sort of, uh, you know, you can say, well, God already knows, or, or someone who could stand outside the process, there's no dynamics there, because no real dynamics, because everything is already set. This event is going to happen at that time and that time. So what I'm proposing is that indeterminism, that the real dynamics comes in having having quantum systems and, and these interactions that indeterminist, indeterministically give rise to space-time events. And then I think that's a real dynamism. No, I, was, I, I was referring to this, I was just 
very simple refer to if we have if you have something like the process you have a mm -hmm. before and an after. Uh, do you lose this or not? No, I mean you very can simple. have you can have a sense of Processes. I would argue that you know it's harder to, to understand the idea of process when you're not using a time index. But but you could think of it. I mean, in a less concrete way by saying, suppose I have um, uh, a series of numbers, a sequence of numbers. Okay. Well, I can I can say that you know, six uh, comes uh, after five and yeah. four is. Before. So you can still have a betweenness and an after. You know, before and after. You can have a kinds of order, and you can have. You I, yeah, you would have an order. I mean, it's a partial ordering. It's a par I can go into. I actually go into how this picture can underlie the causal set picture of Sorkin and, and his collaborators, where you have a partial ordering. The causal set being a space-time, the space-time construct that is a growing kind of space-time. But that, but that contributing to that, there's a dynamic um, underpinning to how process, how events kind of get sprinkled into that set. So, and I don't, you know, this is fruit for, you know, food for thought. This is stuff I have, I don't claim to have a definitive, you know, theory of, and they're really interesting questions. I would just say that, you know, just because something isn't going on within the, you know, X, Y, Z, T, space-time construct, doesn't mean that you can't think of it as dynamic. That would be you know, the only way I would respond to that. Is. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I happen to be a philosopher who has specialized in the questions of realism versus idealism and also the meaning of realism, so I wanted to chime in on that. Um, the, the name currently escapes me, but there's a philosophy paper from 1991 where a philosopher said that real has an existence dimension and an independence dimension. So I personally find it very useful to take existence as the general category and to decide between real and non-real existence within the category uh, real being defined as existing mind or subject or observer independently and non-real existence being defined as existing subject or mind or observer independently. Um, that brings us to the, to the idealism versus realism distinction. Um, the, in my view, the two most important idealists were Barclay and Kant. Um, there's a fundamental difference between the idea that Mr. Darkly says there are no external or no real objects, it's just God that provides the consistency of our phenomena, whereas Kant deposited the things in themselves. And that, that's a uh, main distinction. But what both Barkley and uh, Kant shared is physical anti realism, which is that everything physically only exists through dependently. Uh, what was that last thing you said? That, uh, that, that ever, everything physically only exists observer dependently. The essay is percipi from uh, oh, huh. that, that, that's what they apply to, to the physical, which they equate with the phenomenal world as well. Uh, as yeah, I don't so like So in it. that respect, I <laughs> have to somehow object to your physically real. It sounds a little bit like a contradiction to me. What we rather suggest to talk about uh, physically existent, existent being more neutral and some more physical paper. Hmm. Well, that's really interesting. I mean, I uh, that that involves a, a very, much more subtle distinction and definition of terms that that I've really considered, and I you know I don't necessarily want to reject it. I mean, that might be a, a helpful way to kind of convey the, these these ideas because I real I realize it is kind of surprising to say that these unobservable things are physically real. Um, I mean, I certainly claim that that they exist that they are what is described by a physical theory. So in that sense, that's why I, you know, that's why I call them physically real, that they, they exist and they're described by what we think of as a physical theory. But, but I thank you for raising those other possible uh, definitions. Yeah. But I think a subject, a subject is observer uh, dependent. It doesn't mean that it's physically not real or something, because uh, it's like, for example, if you have like two points in space time that are, um, how to say, space like connected, then uh, the time ordering depends on the observer. But still, if you have one, one or inertial observer, like in special relativity, you can tell the time ordering for every other uh, inertial observer. And yes, in general relativity, it's kind of more complicated because of the more complicated structure.
structures based time, but this is, the principle is, is the same, so that it's all there right? locally. And um, also, I just had a, a different question about, you said like, there, in, in this interpretation, uh, in this action theory, there are uh, uh, like, uh, you always have this low, low kind of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Always have this low, low kind of stuff, and uh, you you also have this in the Copenhagen interpretation, but uh, you can still make the Copenhagen interpretation consistent with special relativity. If you just assume like that, the, that there is no information transmitted in non-local processes. Can you also do it with uh, with this interaction theory? Uh, oh yes, I mean um, the the non-locality. Uh, is basically applying only to those processes that are pre-space time. And when you have this measurement transition, the, um, the actualization of those outcomes always obey relativity theory. In other words, the part that gets us to the tip of the iceberg pre-space time always obeys relativity. So it's, it, in that sense, it is certainly consistent with relativity. Um, and you, you made, I think, a comment about people can be, you know, in different inertia frames and um, and maybe have different descriptions of the same events. Um, I don't take that as meaning that reality is observer dependent. I just think that um, relativity already tells us that we're going to describe a phenomena differently based on, you know, our frame. And, and what's important, though, is that you do have invariance. You have invariance in relativity theory that everyone can, can agree on, everyone can corroborate. And part of what you get from this particular approach when you're actualizing um, measurement outcomes is you're getting a space-time interval. I hadn't really gone into this today, but, but what you're actually generating is an invariant space-time interval. So, so if you look at... Um, a space-time diagram, and if we think of ourselves as sort of, um, you know, on the tip of the iceberg, metaphorically, what's, what's getting actualized is an emission event um, and an absorption event, and, and the transferred photon it provides the structure that connects those two events and, and constitutes that invariant interval. So for instance, if, if I just happen to be, we can have measurement without people, we can have an absorbing atom, but if I, this happens to be your eye or something, okay, and the absorber is in your eye, and then this sort of defines a now, when I, when I have a, an, a, an experience of you know, some phenomenon, then if this defines my now, that in a sense, this, this is also actualizing, this is a sense in which there's a very limited form of what people call retrocausality, although I don't like to think of it as retrocausality because it's not, it's not traveling backwards in time. It's part of the creation, part of the actualization of the space-time construct. Is what's created is, is this event in, in my present as well as the emission event in the past relative to where I am in the present. And, and this really kind of harmonizes with Wheeler's delayed choice experiment. You know, that with, without being observer dependent, because this doesn't have to be a person, I mean, it could be an absorbing atom, that whenever this absorption happens, as described by well-defined probabilities, you get space-time intervals actualized, and those are invariants. So in that sense, they're not observer dependent, they're not frame dependent, although different people, once they can know about these events through what auxiliary light signals will can all corroborate that these events happen but they'll describe them differently. So yeah. So yeah. I was just wondering something I, I didn't understand. Maybe you can clarify for me. What is the ontological difference between the emitter and the observer and the waves? So can the can the emitter and the observer also be described by the alpha wave thing? Good good question. Um, that I forgot to cover. Yes. Um, they are, um, if you're dealing with, say, microscopic emitters and absorbers, they are bound states. So they are, you can think of them as, well, we've got a nucleus, uh, bound system of, if you like, offer waves. 
okay? They're quantum states, they're, they're in that submerged portion of the iceberg. Now, if you've got a, one or more electrons, let's say you've got a hydrogen atom, this you can think of as a bound electron offer wave. So suppose it's in its ground state, okay? It's, it's an offer wave, um, but it's bound, and the fact that it's bound is what allows it to serve as an emitter, not, not if it's in its ground state, because that would violate conservation, but, you know, and similarly, if you've got an absorber, you've got a system, same system where it's in an excited state, it's a bound system, and it can serve as an emitter, because it has internal degrees of freedom that it can drop down to, and so on. So that, that's the key difference between emitters and absorbers and offer waves that in the sense of um, giving up uh, a photon offer wave like this. This is an object that can receive a confirmation and, and constitute that projection operator that signals that a measurement has occurred. And the distinction also is you know, that, that this photon offer wave when there's emission and absorption, we have the offer and the confirmation. We have both of them, and that's represented by this projection operator. Meanwhile, these, these objects change their internal states. So the emitters and absorbers just simply change their internal states. So that's, that's the difference. I mean, you can think of them as bound offer waves, but they're not free, they don't initiate Confirmations like you don't have an electron going out and initi directly initiating an electron confirmation. That's another that's another technical issue that I do go into that in one of my papers. So I can I can refer people who want to hear more about that. I can refer you to a paper on that. Any other students? Okay, is there any other questions? Then thank you very much.